there can be no more important a skill in poker than the ability to value a hand properly. Yeah, yeah, we all know they're good. And you ought to know that that's bad. But is that good? Or is that better? Or does it all depend on where you're sat? Or who you're up against? There's no right or wrong way to play poker. There's not one method that will guarantee success, but there are ways and means for you to maximize your chances of winning. There are good habits and bad habits. There are situations to avoid and situations to seek. And there are those who have the knowledge to exploit them. We're gonna teach you how to master the game from the basics to the advanced. In the last show, we covered all the basics, everything you need to get started in the game. We cleared up what beats what, how the rounds of betting work, and what happens when you get to showdown. Now you know the basics, it's time to get to grips with which cards you should play. Today's show, ladies and gents, is all about starting hands. Yep, today we're going to teach you which cards you should play and which you should throw away. A typical show includes some distinct elements. A tutorial, which runs you through the general principles. The pro analysis segment, where a hand is dissected in detail. And the pro tip section, where we get advice from the biggest names in the game. All focused on helping you improve your skills at the table. And who knows where that could lead. This show looks at poker played all over the world, but today we travel to Barcelona, where we get an insight into the minds of four of the world's best, Barbero, Jurgensen, Barry, and Negrano. Analysis today comes courtesy of 2005 World Series of Poker champion, Joe Hashem, and four times World Series title winner, Daniel Negrano, who together boasts $25 million in live tournament winnings. Priceless tips will be shared by one of poker's hottest properties and the winner of three major titles, Jason Mercia. And you'll find out which are the trickiest cards to play as we explore the horror hands. Okay then, as promised, let's kick off with the first tutorial. There are two basic groups of starting hands, paired and non-paired hands. Let's look at paired hands first. A pair of aces is the strongest starting hand you can have and the lower the rank of the pair, the lower the value of your starting hand. Pocket aces and pocket kings and queens are all regarded as monster hands and should be played pretty much every time. Jacks through to eights are considered medium-sized pairs. They are still strong, but a bit more vulnerable. Pairs from seven to deuces are small pairs. They are still decent hands, but they often lose at a showdown if the community cards haven't given the player three of a kind. The strength of non-paired hands varies a lot, some hands like ace-king suited are very good. Some are extremely weak. The worst hand you can have is seven deuce off suit. <coughs> this is because it is very unlikely to make a straight or flush with these cards. And if you do make a pair, it'll have a poor kicker. Judging the strength of non-paired hands is not as straightforward as evaluating pairs. Let's go into more detail. There are three factors to determine the strength of non-paired starting hands. The most important one is high card value. The higher the cards, the better. It is particularly good to have two very high cards. That way you can hit top pair and use the second card as a strong kicker. Having only one big card is much less favorable. You have only half as much of a chance to hit a big pair on the flop. And if you do, you can easily be beaten by the same pair with a better kicker. Suitedness. If you have two cards of the same suit, your chance to hit a flush is much higher. It's about 6% if your hand is suited and only 1.3% if the cards are off suit. That 6% doesn't sound like much, but if you hit a flush, you often win a very big pot. Being suited doesn't turn a bad hand into a good hand, but it adds considerable value. When your cards are suited, it's especially good if you have at least one big card. That way, you will usually win if someone else hits a flush as well. But if you have two small suited cards, don't worry too much about getting beat by a higher flush. It happens, but it is a pretty rare occurrence. This is only true if there are three of the same suit on the board, though. If you make a flush with four of one suit on the board, you need to give greater consideration to whether you are beaten. 
Your opponent now only needs to have one card of the same suit to hit their flush. And if their card is higher than your high card, they will win the pot. Connectedness. If your cards are close in rank, they can form a straight when combined with the community cards. The closer they are to each other, the better your chances. Gaps of one or two ranks will reduce your chances considerably. With a three rank gap, your chance is very low. With a four rank gap, you can't make a straight using both cards. Hands like Jack-10 and 5-4 have full potential. Recap. So we now know that the worst hands to play are low, unconnected, unsuited cards. 7-2 being the worst hand. Your chance of making straights, flushes, and pairs high enough to win the pot are very low. If you get dealt these kinds of hands, fold them. They will end up costing you a lot of chips in the long run. Now you know what to consider when judging the strength of your starting hand. Holding. Everything you wanted to know about poker is divided into two levels. Level one, the novice level, tells you everything you need to know to get started in the game. You'll be a competent player by the end of these six shows. Learn the power of position, the art of bluffing, and all the basics. Once you've got the basics, we delve deeper. Level two, the experience level, covering getting information from your opponents and the nuances of playing hands dependent on their strength and potential. It also focuses on playing styles, the strategies and tips you'll need to succeed, and how to avoid costly mistakes. Following the review show at the end of level two, we should have covered everything you want to know about poker, and you'll be ready to become a successful player. And if you want to get good, then listen up. The next tutorial will save you making a common and costly mistake. They say that curiosity killed the cat, but it's done for many a novice poker player too. One of the most common mistakes a newbie makes is to see too many flops. They can't resist it. Too many times when confronted with average cards, they call to see a flop. This is called the limp. Just because you see more hands, it doesn't mean you're gonna win more chips. This tutorial is gonna show you some tips on how to play with conviction. We're here to help. Raise or fold. Calling isn't illegal, but typically, you should raise or fold. If you have a strong hand, raise. If you have a weak hand, fold. It sounds simple enough, right? If you're not sure, don't play. Sometimes you might not be sure if a hand is strong or weak. King Jack looks nice, but what if the guy next to you has King Queen? In this situation where you are unsure, just fold. You must be sure of how you play in poker. Play with conviction, don't limp. Raise three times the big blind. In this example, the blinds are 50-100, so you should raise to 300. This will get rid of some of the weaker hands that could come back to bite you if you're not careful. Simple, no? Follow these straightforward rules and you will save yourself losing chips and playing pots when you're just not sure. Play with conviction, people. Raise or fold. Avoid the limp. We've covered the limp. Now let's examine some other poker terminology. You have a big hand? Raise when he's behind and shake when he's ahead. Something tells me you have a monster. As we take a look at some nicknames given to different pocket pairs. As you can imagine, the best pocket pair in poker has lots of nicknames. Bullets, American Airlines, and Pocket Rockets, to name just a few. Next up, we meet the Cowboys. Yeehaw! The name given to two kings. Howdy. But we mustn't forget their prettier other halves, the ladies. Two queens. The hooks. Jack's got a name based on the shape of the letter J. Makes sense. Wheelchairs, the name for a pair of fives. Logical. And last but not least for today, a friendly pair of ducks. The name given to a pair of twos. Quack, quack indeed. Now, here's some advice from one of the best in the business. 2005 World Series of Poker champ Joe Hashem analyzes a hand for us. Today we're going to look at how costly playing bad hands can be. We have Boomer in middle position 
with a premium hand, a pair of queens. It's basically the third best hand you can start with. He elects to raise to 300. Now, this raise is designed to get all players with weaker hands to fold. Smokey, with 7-8 of hearts, a suited connector, elects to call the raise. 7-8 of hearts is a suited connector and it can become very effective, especially in position. It's folded around to the big blind boy wonder, who elects to call with jack four. He's probably elected to play this hand because he's already put some chips into the pot and it's not costing him too much more to play. But his big mistake is that his hand is too weak to play. A lot of amateurs, a lot of beginners make this mistake. Don't be fooled into playing hands that you shouldn't be. So let's have a look at the flop. The flop comes jack 10-6. And this is why it's a mistake to play jack four. Because now Boy Wonder has made a pair of jacks, which is what we call top pair. Boy Wonder checks. Boomer decides to bet 400 chips. Smokey wisely folds. But now Boy Wonder is in a tough spot because he has top pair. He elects to call the 400. Let's see the turn card. The turn card is another six. Nothing much has changed for Boy Wonder. He still has top pair. And he's way behind Boomer's pair of queens. Boy Wonder checks again. And Boomer now bets a thousand chips. Boy Wonder elects the call. He's in a tough spot because he feels that his pair of jacks may be the best hand not knowing that Boomer has a pair of queens which totally crushes him at this stage. Let's see the river card. The river card is a very safe three of hearts. Boy Wonder again checks his option and Boomer now bets 1800 chips. Boy Wonder elects the call and loses the hand when he sees Boomer's pair of queens. This example shows how you can lose a lot of chips in a tournament by playing very weak hands. Don't make that mistake yourself. If you want to learn more about poker, then go to pokerstars.com. Some starting hands to avoid playing. You know, you don't really want to play offsuit hands that are not connected, like, uh, you know, seven deuce is always a bad hand to play, you know. Um, basically any hand that can't make a straight, um, even if it's suited, it's probably not too good to be playing. You know, hands like uh, queen five suited and things like that. Okay, that's the end of part one and time for a question about starting hands. It's all well and good having ace jack, how does your hand fare against a low pocket pair? Fret not, we're here to help. But before we do, let's see if you can work one out for yourselves. If you have ace jack off and your opponent has a pair of sixes, what percentage chance do you have of winning the hand? Answer after the break. Hmm. Before the break, we asked you what percentage chance of winning you would have if you had ace jack off against a pair of sixes. The answer? 46%, or as most call it, a coin flip due to it being so close to 50-50. You need to hit at least an ace, a jack, or some kind of straight, or flush to win the hand. If your ace jack is suited, your percentage rises to 48% because you have a higher chance of hitting that flush. Let's take a look at some more. This time, you have king-queen, and your opponent has a pair of eights. What's the likelihood of you winning in this one? Exactly the same, silly. You still have two over cards against your opponent's pair. The best hand to have against pocket aces is pocket aces. But after that, what do you want to be holding? You don't want a pair of kings. The answer is five, six suited. Like all suited connectors, it has a stronger chance to hit a straight or flush than other hands. The reason you want five, six suited is because the cards that make the straight, two, three, four, and seven, eight, nine, will not help the ace hit a higher straight. Your likelihood of winning, 23%. Bottom line, you still want aces. Yeah! 
Some hands might look nice, but don't be fooled. They look a lot stronger than they appear. Some of the biggest pots in poker games are between two strong starting hands, and quite often one of them is what we like to call a horror hand. King 10 off. King 8. Jack King. I'd say Ace Queen is a pretty difficult hand to play. One of the most common horror hands, Jacks or the Hooks. They look great, and hey, they win most of the time. Very strong hand. You get pocket jacks. You want to raise before the flop, put some pressure on the players in the blinds. But ponder this. On the flop, more than half the time, you'll find at least one overcard, a queen, a king, or an ace. The question is whether your opponents are holding one. Our advice? To minimize the number of players in the hand by playing aggressively. Limit your post-flop opponents, and you'll reap the benefits. For example, in this hand from the big game, Scott Seaver picks up pocket jacks and raises pre-flop. King 10 for the cannon. He's out. Forcing everyone to fold apart from Vanessa Russo. His raise eliminated the chance for Aaron Jensen to outflop him, and he only has one overcard to deal with on a 9-10 king flop. With Russo checking the flop and the turn, he can now assume she doesn't have the king and wins a nice little pot, all thanks to his pre-flop raise. Another horror hand, the weak ace. Ace three offsuit, stuff like that really gets you into trouble. One of the things I see a lot of beginners do is that they see an ace and they automatically think that it's a great hand. If you have ace 10 and someone has like ace jack or ace queen, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. In this hand, two opponents make a pair of aces on the flop, but one of them is destined to lose a lot of chips. Uh oh, here could be some trouble for Maslow. They both flop aces. This is what makes an ace with a weak kicker a horror hand. There's always the chance your opponent has an ace with a better kicker, and it's not easy to fold top pair. So there you have it. Always beware Jax and the ace with a weak kicker. Beware, people, beware. Now, you might want to watch out for one hand in particular. Here's Daniel Negrano, the man with the highest tournament earnings of all time, to explain. On today's show, we're gonna be talking about Ace-10. Why Ace-10? Because Ace-10 is the epitome of a trouble hand. On this hand, we have an amateur, Ernest Wiggins, playing on the big game against some professional players. Now, here he's dealt Ace-10 offsuit right next to the button, and he decides to just call. I don't like this play at all. If you're gonna play Ace-10, which is a marginal hand, you need to be the aggressor. You need to be raising or folding. And I think with this hand in late position, it's certainly worth a raise, so that's what he should have done. Instead, he just calls. Now I fold, but Doyle Brunson, he calls from the small blind. And in the big blind, Phil Locke has absolutely nothing, a queen six offsuit. And he decides to, to raise the pot, okay? Now, you've got your ace 10, you've limped in. And what you've allowed to have happen here is Phil Locke is bullying you. He doesn't know here that Phil Locke has queen six. Phil Locke could have one of those hands that have him dominated. Ace jack, ace queen, ace king, or even jacks, queens, kings, or aces. Wow. Had you raised with ace 10 coming in, everybody folds, you pick up the pot, which is the ideal situation with a hand like ace 10. You don't really want anyone to call because there's so many hands better than ace 10. So really, it's basically like a hand you want to steal with. What you don't want to do is play it weak, limp in, and then be forced to fold to a raise. I do like the fold, though, because once you've limped in and you've been raised, you don't want to defend with ace-10. You're always better being the raiser than the caller. Now we're going to take a look at a hand that was played at an EPT final table, and once again, the hand in question is ace-10. Okay. <laughs> With the blinds at 20 and 40,000, Ivo Donev has dealt ace 10 of hearts. Now, he's got a little over 20 big blinds, a little over 800,000 in chips, which makes this spot a very tricky situation. If he just makes a standard raise at something like 80 or 90,000, somebody may re-raise him, putting him in an awkward spot. So what does he like to do? He likes to go all in. Don't necessarily love this play, because if anyone behind you has one of those hands that have you dominated, they're surely gonna call. Ace queen, ace king, pocket jacks are better, are definitely gonna call. And if they do, you're gonna be a big underdog to win this pot. Okay. Right. And there you go, a little bit unlucky, but someone behind him has ace queen. And because he's moved all in here, it doesn't look like he has aces or kings, he's likely gonna get called by all these hands. I would have preferred a standard raise and then maybe fold to a re-raise with a hand like ace 10. So now the dreaded situation has arised. He's up against ace queen. He's gonna have to catch a 10 or three hearts, which makes him about a two to one underdog. Right. So no luck there for Donev. He hits the rail with ace 10, and you will too if you overplay it in these kind of situations. Be careful with ace 10, use it as a stealing hand, and don't get too involved.
Thanks, Daniel, for clearing that up. Now, decisions in life are often down to one's own personal preference, but in poker, the decisions we make are based on minute, detailed calculations. Most of the time. In this hand, taken from Copenhagen in Season 3 of the European Poker Tour, the Dane, Theo Jorgensen, has pushed all in with aces. Richard Toth has Queen-9. That's Queen-9. Now, if you've learned anything from this show... How much is it in total? You should have learned that Queen-9, a suited to gapper, has potential, but not against a guy who's pushed all in. An easy decision, surely. Not if you take instinct into account. Theo, I think I have to trust in my instincts. And it's as if you've got nothing on this. Well, your instinct was wrong, Richard. Or was it? Oh, my goodness. And there's the ten of hearts. A flush on the river. Nice catch. His instincts were right. Go figure. If you want to watch the show again, recap previous episodes, or join the series at a more advanced level, then go to everythingpoker.com. What do you want to drink? Theo, I think I have to trust in my instincts. Please, stop. Not again. To Barcelona now, and a chance to hear the pros take on the strength of different starting hands. Theo Jurgensen, he of the bad beat, is in attendance along with EPT San Remo champion Liv Beret, two-time LAPT champion Nacho Barbero, and the one and only Daniel Negrano. Well, like when I started playing, you know, limit holding back in the day, everyone was so big on like starting hands. You can't play this in this position and all that, but I was much looser and much more aggressive and wilder. And like, it was always my belief that the real skill comes post-flop and starting hand requirements are kind of like overrated. I know you, <laughs> I'll point to you because I know you play on that. Do you believe that sometimes people spend far too much time worrying about like pre-flop starting hand requirements rather than situations? Yeah, I think they do. You gotta race in some spots. But at the beginning, I also believe that you gotta avoid some certain spots being a beginner. So it's like, don't be racing with like ace-10 under the gun. Under the gun is a position on the table, the first to act. We'll cover it in the next show. Weak aces are like, hands that are gonna get you in trouble later on. Feels like the better you are as a player, and I always give this advice, the better you are as a player, the more hands you can play. Simply, but there are, as you mentioned, like hands like, are there hands that you just find that, for example, for yourself, that you find, okay, when you're in a tournament or whatever the case may be, that you seem to be doing fine, and there's a certain type of hand that you're like, oh boy, this is dangerous, I could blow my whole stack here, so maybe you decide to throw it away or, or just play cautiously. Other types of hands that you would, and what, what are they? What kind of hands would you? Especially hands like Nacho talked about, the like ace. Ace-10s and... Ace-10, even ace-jack, something like that, when you're sitting there in the, on the button, for an example, okay? And you raise, and it's up against aggressive players, and you know there's a big chance you might get a re-raise here. And then you have to take a very, very difficult decision whether you have to f go with this one or not. Do you think there's a group of hands that are underrated? Well, yeah, things like suited one gappers. Poker players refer to two cards like seven and nine as one gappers. There's a gap of one between them. Two gappers even. Like seven, nine of clubs and six, eight of spades, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I actually really like, like, Nineteen suited. It makes you so much money on the long term. That I mean. That you know, I agree. Like we talk about trouble hands. You know, you mentioned ace ten off suit, right? That's a hand where you know in a position it's gra it's it's not something you want to play. But a hand like nine ten suited, completely different. Now, if you look at the two hands side by side and run it hot and cold, ace ten is way better than nine ten suited. But not when you factor in post flop play. Whenever I teach someone, you know, new, you basically teach them a very stringent like starting hands rules where you got to play tight and you got to play aggressive when you do, and you're going to get exploited because people are going to know that and they're going to pick up on it, but if you're new to the game, it's really the best approach. If you just get in there and start gambling like, like the pros do, you know, you're going to get outplayed left, right, and center. So we might not have covered everything you wanted to know about poker, but we're making good progress. Let's review what we've just learned. We explore the properties of good starting hands. We took a look at the kind of hands you should be playing. We also looked at how to avoid the costly mistake of limping and checked out some of the hardest hands to play. 
To practice all you've learned in the show today, go to PokerStars.com and follow the simple instructions for downloading the free software. Once on the site, enter a play money table. And this week's task is to only play the types of hands we suggested in this show and avoid limping wherever possible. If you follow our advice, you may be surprised at the results. Here's what's coming up on the next show. We take our first look at position, explain what it is and why it matters so much. We'll review some great hands from around the world, take in more expert analysis and some words of wisdom from four players it's really worth listening to. If this wasn't enough, we look at where the origins of poker lie as we pay homage to this fantastic pastime. This is the greatest card game on the planet, ladies and gents. Let's master it together.